Because it's a topic that, if we don't get right, we will be opposed to the purpose of God with this earth. It's a topic that can either help us to be led to the things of Almighty God or turn us from him. You see, what we're going to look at tonight is Israel. Israel, both the people and the land. And we're going to look at them in light of Bible prophecy. Prophecy both past, present and future. And it's important that we look at them together because the land of Israel and the people of Israel in the purpose of Almighty God are inseparable. You cannot take the two apart. In Scripture, the first time that Israel is mentioned is in Genesis chapter 32 and verse 28. And it's a time when Jacob was told that his name would no longer be called Jacob, a supplanter, but it would be called Israel, or a prince with ale or God. And in Genesis 32 verse 28, and he, that's the angel that was with him, said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. So the name of Jacob, the son of Isaac, was changed from Jacob to Israel. And from here forward throughout scripture, there's many notable phrases that refer to Israel. That notable phrases in relation to this name, in in relation to Israel, that are important for us to take notice of. In the scripture, if you look in something like Strong's or an online concordance, you'll find that Israel appears just short of 5,000 times in the scripture, the word Israel. The phrase of Israel, the simple search, will show this 1,500 times. But then we have the children of Israel, 603 times. The God of Israel, 201 times. And then there's a multitude of others the land of Israel, 31 times, referring to the earth or a specific plot of land. We have the tribes of Israel, 52 times. Congregation of Israel, 23 times. Elders of Israel, 34 times. And the house of Israel, 146 times. So it's very clear that throughout the Bible, Israel is important. You see in scripture the name of Israel, after Jacob's name was changed to Israel, became the name of his descendants, as in Israel or the Jews, but it was also attached to the land which they would ultimately settle once they left Egypt, after they'd wandered through the land, through the wilderness, for 40 years. Tonight we're going to limit ourselves to two phrases there, the children of Israel and the land of Israel. We'll start with the land of Israel. The word land refers to the earth, a a specific plot of land, according to Strong's Concordance. And hence when we read this, we should not think of just the earth, but a specific place on earth. A specific place God has determined should be called the land of Israel. And the minds of most, when you, ter- when you say that, would go to that little tract of land that Israel today inhabits, that slither of land that Israel currently occupies, and that slither of land over which there is much conjecture. We have it in the moment, don't we? Should, we have the gold- should they have the Golden Heights? What of the Palestinians? Should they be given the land? What of Jerusalem? And as of yesterday, what of the West Bank? Because Mr Netanyahu has said if he's elected, he'll annex the West Bank. The discussion around this is long and contentious, but it doesn't need to be the case. It doesn't need to be the case because God has defined in Scripture what the land of Israel refers to. If we go back to the book of Genesis, and if you'll turn back there, please, with me, we have from Genesis chapter 12 to Genesis 22, a series of promises that were made to Abraham. Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation. 
And in this series of promises, he gives a progression of promises or prophecies to Abraham of what would occur, of what would be given to Abraham for faith. And it's extended to his son Isaac and to Jacob, to the Jewish people as opposed to the Arabs. And we'll have a little bit to say about that in a minute. In Genesis 13, verse 14 to 17, is where we are going to start. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward, and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed for ever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise and walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. And if you have a look just before that, I think you can pick up where Abraham was standing. He was standing in a place where he could look over the city of Sodom, the area today that is the Dead Sea. He was standing in what we today know as the land of Israel. The land Abraham was in, or Abram as he was known then was in, the land he could see and he could feel under his feet was to be given to him and to his seed forever. This promise or prophecy of the future was further detailed to him in chapter 15 and verse 18. And here the extent of the land promised to Abraham is given. And such should end all discussion, but it doesn't. Because men try to solve the problem, don't they, on political level, the current nation of Israel included. They try and solve it politically. Yes, we will have a nation for the Palestinians if they'll give us peace, but that's not how God sees it. Because these people don't care for the words of Scripture. They prefer to lean on their own understanding which will only bring them to their own destruction. In verse 18 of Genesis 15, we said we read, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. So we have it up the top there, in a slightly different orange to the rest of it. From the river Nile over the other side there down to the bottom of the Red Sea, over to the top of the Persian Gulf, I think, and up the river Euphrates. There's a few nations in there that are going to be a little disappointed. You see, the, by contrast, the Arab people were promised the land to the south, where it says Ishmael there. That area there was promised to the Arabs. And in Scripture it talks about the day when that will be covered in a forest. The areas of Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Oman, I think the UAE is in there, and some others. And this is what the Arab people were in, were, will ultimately inherit for eternity when Abraham and his seed inherit that land of Israel at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we go on in Genesis to chapter 26 and verses 2 to 6, we find that the Lord God appeared unto Isaac, the son of Abraham, and he promised him that same land. It's a prophecy of the future as far as Isaac is concerned as well. In verse 2 of Genesis 26, And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries, and will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham my father. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws. 
So Abraham was also, sorry, Isaac was also promised that same land. And in turn, Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. And it was Jacob, the son of Isaac, in whom the promise was passed, as Esau declined to follow that which God required. And if we turn over again in Genesis to Genesis 35, verse 10 to 12, we have where this is repeated to Jacob, who was told that the promise to Abraham and the promise to Isaac would be extended to him. The promise, a prophecy of the future as well. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee. And kings shall come out of thy loins. And the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed after thee will I give the land. So the promise of the land was made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. The last of whom, as we saw before, had his name changed to Israel. And this was a promise to the fathers of the nation. And it should also be, when we look at it, seen as a prophecy of what is yet to occur with that land. Because those three men have not received the promise as of yet. And God has been very specific in what he said here. He gave the land to Abraham, but Abraham had more than one son. He had Ishmael, from whom came the Arabs. He had the tribes, the, the ten sons that came from a second wife he had, called Keturah. And he sent them down into the area there that we know today as Saudi Arabia. There was Isaac and he had two sons. One was Jacob who became Israel and the other was Esau who became the Edomites and lived in the area to the east in the area of Jordan, in the desert areas. But it was promised to Jacob who had 12 sons, the fathers of the nation of Israel. If we look in the New Testament, we're told who will ultimately inherit this land. If we look in Galatians 3 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul explains this for us. He says to now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not and to seeds as of many, but as of one and to thy seed, which is Christ. So the Apostle Paul very clearly explains here that the seed of Abraham is the Lord Jesus Christ. So Abraham was promised this land. He was promised that he would inherit it with his seed, singular, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we go on, not that one, to that one, to Galatians 3, verse 27 to 29, we see that for as many of you as have been baptised into Christ have put on Christ. Okay, so it's telling us that those who are baptised into Christ have put on Christ. And then in verse 29 it tells us that if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So what am I trying to show here? Well, yes, the promise was made to Abraham and to his seed, as in one or singular. But that seed, that singular seed, is promised also to a multitude, to all those who are baptised into Christ and are then classed as the seed of Abraham. They become heirs of that promise to inherit that land for eternity. So men like Abraham, David, the prophets, the apostles and all the faithful through the ages fall into what is called Abraham's seed and they are heirs of the promise. So if we return back to Israel in particular, as I said before, in Scripture, Israel refers to both the land of Israel, the land from the river Euphrates to the river Nile, and it's a land today that's much fought over, and the source of much dispute, 
It's divided between Israel, Syria, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Lebanon and Egypt. That tract of land that we saw back before. But ultimately it's going to be one land. It's going to be one land with one king, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it will be inherited by Abraham and his seed, both Jewish and those who are non-Jewish, who are classed as the heirs of promise through baptism. Well then, what are the children of Israel? And as I said before, we cannot consider one without the other. And obviously these are the people that came from Jacob. In Genesis 45 and verse 21, we have a reference to the children of Israel, the sons of Jacob who had come into Egypt at that time to buy corn from the Egyptians. Because in the land of, in the land of Canaan and in Egypt there was a great drought and that drought was going to continue or famine was going to continue for many years. And the children of Israel, the sons of Jacob, came down to Egypt to buy corn. And they were known there as the children of Israel. And those sons of Jacob and Jacob himself went down into Egypt as God told them they should, that they might be preserved through that drought. And if you turn over to Exodus chapter 1, we'll see what these people became known as. Exodus chapter 1 and verse 7. We read that the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly. In verse 9, he said unto his people, Pharaoh said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. In verse 12, But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were grieved because of the children of Israel. In verse 13, and the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigour. So within 400 years, or less than that, from Jacob, the, children, the, the descendants of Jacob, the Jewish people, were known as the children of Israel. And that's how the, uh, the Egyptians referred to them. And it's by this name that they're known throughout the remainder of Scripture. And we know that God visited the children of Israel in Egypt. And he brought them to the land of Canaan as it was then known. And while they were en route to that land, God made a promise or a prophecy to them that would occur for obedience to him or disobedience to his ways. And that's our reading that we had tonight in Leviticus chapter 26. If you'll turn back there, please. We're going to go through that briefly. Leviticus 26 that we had read is really a prophecy of the history of Israel as far as we are concerned. It is a prophecy that was given back then of the history as we see it today of Israel. And we know that ultimately Israel rejected Almighty God and for this God allowed and he continues to allow the nations of the earth to judge them for him. He sent the Babylonians, the Romans, the Assyrians against them and they'll yet feel the hand of the Russians against them as we saw in our address last week and I don't intend to go into that in any detail. And it's after that that they will ultimately return back to God in obedience following the intervention of God through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, on this earth. And we find that in each of these cases that I mentioned in history, Israel was carried off into the nations. The Babylonians did it. The Romans did it. They were scattered, exactly as the prophecy said would occur. And each time a few returned, exactly as prophecy said would occur. We find that the first 13 verses gives the blessing to these people for obedience. The way God would bless them if they were obedient to him. In verse 3 we find that they'd receive rain and the land would yield her increase. They'd be blessed in agriculture so that they had sufficient food. In verse 5 they dwell safely, not in any land, in their land, the land of Israel. They would have peace, verse 6 to 9, in their land, 
and chased their enemies such that there was none that could stand before them. You know, the nations around them today are scared of Israel. But what God tells us is that if they'd been obedient, none would have stood before them. They would be a great nation, verse 9 to 10, in number, and they would have plenty. In verse 11 to 12, God would be among them to preserve them and to keep them. And in verse 13, they're reminded it was God who brought them out of the land of Egypt. So you see, if Israel had have been obedient to Almighty God, he would have seen that they were maintained in that land. He would have seen that they were not scattered. He would have seen that they had plenty, that their enemies could do nothing against them. But we know what happened, don't we? We know that they turned their back on Almighty God. And with the exception of a few short years in history, those promises were not a reality to them. They've been always ignorant of his ways, as they continue to be today, or not always, but for the bulk of their history. If you go to the end of that chapter, we'll have a very quick look at verse 46. Almighty God says, These are the statutes and judgments and laws which the Lord made between him and the children of Israel in Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. So Almighty God said to them, Be obedient, and, I'll be, and I will do this. And if you're disobedient, well, this is what is going to happen. And we know what occurred. They were disobedient. And if we go back to verse 14 to 15, we read exactly this. God said to them, and bear in mind that this is before they even reached the land of Israel, the land of Canaan as it was known then. They were camped at Mount Sinai, where they got the law, where they were organised into a nation. He says in verse 14, But if ye will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments, and if ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant. And to the letter, the words of this prophecy, the words of this warning to Israel have come to pass because the nation failed to heed these warnings. In verse 16, they were told that they would sow their seed in vain and others would eat it. And we know this occurred, don't we, if we read the judges in Scripture. They planted it and others ate it. In the times of Gideon, they were too scared to thresh the wheat because of their enemies. And what happens today? Well, others don't eat it, but those in Gaza send balloons over the border with um, some incendiary device on it and they burn their crops. You see, things haven't changed because they are still, they have turned their back on Almighty God. In verse 17, we're told that God would set his face against them and they would flee. And how many nations have come against Israel and this has occurred? The Babylonian invasion, the Roman invasion, the Assyrians, they came against that nation and caused them to flee. And they cut, destroyed the nation and carted them off into captivity. In verse 25, we're told that they would be delivered into the hand of their enemies. And over the years, this has been a constant for the Jew and for the, for the Jew, for the children of Israel. Through the dark ages, in Europe, it was a constant, wasn't it? They'd been scattered into Europe. And they went from one place to another, being persecuted by those in Europe. In World War II, we know what occurred. There were six million of them destroyed. The children of Israel, we find against them even today, there is a growing swell of anti-Jewish feeling against them. In Leviticus 26, verse 23 to 24, we read, And if ye will not be reformed by me, by these things, but will walk contrary unto me. Then will I also walk contrary unto you and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. You see, so it wasn't just a fact that Almighty God said, or 
told them nothing. He told them exactly what was going to occur to them. And if you read those verses again in your own time, you'll see that through history, exactly what God has told them would occur, did occur, as punishment for their sins. Why? Because they turned their back on Almighty God and did not take notice of those judgments that he was going to send on them. We're told that God would walk contrary to or against them for their evil ways and they'd be punished. Verse 27 to 33, he says, Then will I walk contrary unto you as in fury, and I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. And ye shall eat the flesh of your sons, and the flesh of your daughters shall ye eat. And I will destroy your high places, and cut down your images, and cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols. And my soul shall abhor you. And I will make your cities waste and bring my sanctuaries, bring your sanctuaries unto desolation. And I will not smell the savour of your sweet odours. And I will bring the land into desolation. And your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it. And I will scatter you among the heathen. And I will draw out a sword after you and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. And we know what happened in AD 70 if we are aware of history. The Roman armies came against the Jews and they scattered them throughout the world. They scattered them to the four corners of the world such that today there's a Jew in every country. Even in those countries that are sworn to be their enemies, there's Jews there. And while they were dispersed in the countries that they were scattered to, they found no rest. Why? Well, because they knew what would occur. They'd read these things, but they have failed to acknowledge that it was Almighty God who had done it and turned back to him. In verse 36 to 39, we read that upon them that are left alive of you, I will send a faintness into their hearts in the land of their enemies, and the sound of a shaken leaf shall chase them, and they shall flee as fleeing from the sword. And they shall f fall when none pursueth. And they shall fall one upon another as if it were before a sword when none pursueth. And ye shall have no, enemy, no power to stand before your enemies. And ye shall perish upon the heathen or the nations. And the land of your enemies shall eat you up. And they that are left of you shall pine away in their iniquity in their enemies' land and also in the iniquities of their fathers shall they pine away with them. And as we mentioned, since AD 70, they've been scattered throughout the earth. And we know what happened in the Second World War, don't we, when six million of them were destroyed. And they were powerless in the face of their enemies. Exactly as what was said here. The land of their enemies ate them up. The sound of that shaken leaf caused them to flee. And it hasn't changed since second, the Second World War. Yes, it mightn't be as blatant as that. But there's still many nations that persecute the Jew. And that goes on. You know, it's an interesting fact I saw. Then on the 24th of May, 1991, they went and rescued some Jews from Ethiopia where they feared persecution was going to come on them. They put 1,086 people on a Boeing 747 and 1,088 hopped off at the other end. Just wait till Pontus works that one out. They were jammed in to get them out of that place. In verse 44 we read, Yet for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly, and to break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. But I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt, in the sight of the heathen, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. These are the statutes and judgments and laws which the Lord made between him and the children of Israel in Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. You see, Almighty God says, when they're in the land of their enemies, I won't let them be utterly destroyed. 
I'll preserve some because of the covenant, because of the promise he made with their fathers. He will not cast them away for utterly and he will not allow them to be utterly destroyed. And we saw that, didn't we, in the Second World War. Yes, there was an awful lot of them that were killed, but there were some that were attained alive. You know, Scripture is very clear as to what will occur to those who are preserved. For those who were here last week, they would have seen what will happen in the land of Israel when Russia and Europe invade. And the children of Israel in that land are del delivered by the Lord Jesus Christ. Those people, some of the people that are, are preserved by Almighty God are in that land today. You know, the prophet Amos, in his closing words of his prophecy, tells us what the Jews could look forward to. He tells us that God will bless them and he will cause them to inhabit the land of Israel as was promised to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. In Amos 9 verse 13 he says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the ploughman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him that soweth grapes. Does that remind us of what we read in Leviticus 26? And the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. And I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel. And they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land. In verse 14, the people of Israel. Verse 15, I will plant them upon their land and they shall be no more pulled out of their land which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. You see, Almighty God says, despite what you have done, Israel, despite the fact that I drove you into all nations, despite the fact that you turned your back on me, because of the promise I made to your fathers, I will plant you in your own land and ultimately nobody will remove you from them. Yes, as far as the thinking of the Jew is concerned, it has to change and it will change. And Israel has to return to Almighty God and that will occur in the future. We'll conclude with a, cup, a look at a few other prophecies. A few other prophecies of those things that are occurring in the world at the moment that show the nearness of the Lord Jesus Christ's return to this earth as far as prophecy is concerned. And also other prophecies of the people of Israel. You see, we could have considered the fact that Russia is on the border of, of Israel in Syria. We could have looked at the fact that Scripture says the Jews are a nation and a land called Israel that they'd be persecuted, such as in the Holocaust, before they return to the land of Israel. The fact that Jerusalem today is in the hands of the Jews or the children of Israel. That Jerusalem causes turmoil in the nations. They can't work out what it is. Uh, they can't work out the answer to that city because they don't read what the scriptures say. We could look at the fact that Israel sees its own existence as being according to their own might. They're currently ranked as the 11th strongest nation in the world, militarily, but they have a population of 0.1% of the world. We could look at the fact, and we have already really, that Israel as a nation does not trust in their God. The fact that Saudi Arabia, Yemen, the UAE, Yes, the UAE are starting to align with the Jews and Israel. You know, I read in the last week that you, I think it's the UAE said we were silly not to have relations with Israel for the last 40 years. They're in that area of Sheba and Dedan that was spoken about last, last week. These were all nations that a few years ago had vowed to destroy Israel. Well, what are the Jews in the land today? For the greater part of the Jewish history since AD 70, the Jews have been scattered throughout the nations, as we know. They've found no rest for the sole of their feet. They've gone from one place to another. 
And we're told in scripture that they'd say, would God it were night. Would God it were the morning. Because of fear for what was going to come on them. And if you read accounts such as that of Anne Frank, you'll know that that is what occurred. And they've been scattered and persecuted through the nations to this day. But this situation is not to continue. They weren't to remain scattered without a home. Ultimately, the Jew, we know, will inherit that land from the Euphrates to the River Nile. But this will not be arranged by man. But it will be by the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Jews we see in the land today are but an initial return to that land. They're an initial return that was prophesied in Joel chapter 3. In Joel 3, verse 1 to 3, we read, or verse 1, For behold, in those days and in that time when I, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. we told that God would bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. Judah or the Jews, they've returned to the land. They've started returning to the land. And Jerusalem, we know, is in the hands of the Jews, the capital city of Israel. And Joel 3 shows that this will occur at a time when God is caused to plead for his people Israel, his people who are in the land, and he will plead for these nations. Why? Because they're called his heritage Israel, whose land, and why is he going to, um, why is he going to plead against, for Israel against the nations? We'll see in a minute. Because they have divided the land. And we know that's happened in history, don't we? They did it after, I think, the First World War, when Lawrence of Arabia and General Allenby had it split in a certain way, or the British did. And they do it again today. They hand back a bit to Egypt. They say we'll have a two-state solution. And so up until 1948, this had not been fulfilled. The captivity, of, oops, the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem has started. The Jews are back in the land. But what are we told in verse 2? When this occurs, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. And they have cast lots for my people and given a boy for an harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. You see, we're told that all nations will come against God's people Israel and he'll plead with them there for what he terms his heritage Israel, who they have scattered and for his land, the land of Israel that they have divided. You know, every peace proposal that's put forward involves dividing the land. They want to split it and give a bit to the Palestinians, a bit here. In Joel 3, verse 16, The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. You see, what scripture shows is those nations that come against Israel will destroy them. But God will intervene to show that he is the strength of their people. He will ultimately make them turn to him. Turn to him in truth. Yes, a lot has to change, doesn't it? If we go over to Ezekiel 38, it says that after many days thou shalt be visited. You see, Israel has to be in the land as we have today. It's a prophecy of what we see there today. We read that after many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people. Where's the Jews come from? They've come out of every nation of the world. You know, Israel must be the most multicultural nation there is. They talk about multiculturalism. They've come from everywhere. And these people that come against Israel are going to come against the mountains of Israel, which have always been waste. But it is brought forth out of the nations. Okay, in verse 14. In that day when my people of Israel dwelleth safely. We're told that in that day, 
the people of Israel will dwell safely. And it has the idea of confidently. And if you want to talk about a nation that dwells confidently, go and Google the address of Mr Netanyahu at the AIPAC meeting, I think it is, on YouTube. And he talks about the things that they have done by their strength. There is supreme confidence in what he says about what they can do. In verse 14, God calls them my people of Israel. In verse 15, they shall come up against my people of Israel, against my land. In verse 18, they'll come against the land of Israel. And once again, in verse 19, the land of Israel. And I've skipped through that pretty fast, but what I'm trying to show is that the children of Israel are in the land of Israel, dwelling safely or securely by their own might. And that is what scripture tells us is going to occur at the time just prior to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what about one more? Isaiah 10, verse 20. And it's talking about the day when Israel has been saved. And it says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob, from that battle, of, battle we heard about last week, shall no more stay upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. I think this is very interesting with what we see going on today in Israel. The prophet tells us that ultimately Israel will look to their God. But who do they look to today? Well, they look to the one who's going to smite them. And I had here that we could expect this nation to turn to Russia as a state, as one to lean on. What's happened this week? Have you followed the news? Well, Mr Netanyahu, he went up to Russia and he spoke to Mr Putin to discuss how they could work together to get Iran out. And on the 4th of April, just a few days ago, it was the second meeting they had in five weeks. And the Times of Israel reported on the 5th of April in relation to this, this visit and in relation to the remains of an uh, IDF soldier that the Russians had returned to Israel who had been killed in 1982. Mr Netanyahu was quoted as saying, two years ago I asked you, Mr Putin, to help us find the bodies of missing Israeli soldiers and you have responded in the affirmative. I would thank you, my friend for what you have done, Mr. Putin told, Mr. Netanyahu told Putin. You see, what's Israel doing? It's trusting in the hand of the one who will smite them. You see, the world at large sees Israel, don't they, as a, the world's problem. But those who see it that way are sleepwalking to their own destruction. Yes, the Jews today have a few, with few exceptions, don't fear Almighty God. And they are going to have to learn a few things before they turn to God. Tonight what I've endeavoured to do is to show that the Jew, the children of Israel and the land of Israel, both have his, has a future that are connected, that cannot be pulled apart. The land of Israel, while today divided among the nations, will ultimately be the home of the seed of Abraham, who will inherit it with those who are the natural children of Israel, who in that day will see the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac and of Jacob, as their God. Now just as Israel was told exactly what was going to occur to them, what was going to occur to that nation, we also know what's going to occur in this world today. We can read it in the scriptures and see what's going on, so we're without excuse. Israel read it and turned their back on it. The question is, what are we going to do with it? We know that Russia and what is going to happen there. We know that Europe will be aligned with Russia. We know that the Jews in the land will dwell securely or they'll dwell with confidence. And we know that Jerusalem is a burdensome stone for all who touch it. Or do we? You see, Scripture tells us what's going on. We can be like Israel over history and ignore it and choose ignorance. 
Or we can be like the few faithful ones throughout history who have looked at those things and said, yes, I know what Almighty God has planned for this earth. Tonight I've but scratched the surface of this subject and that any of the Christadelphians here would be happy to discuss this further with you, to assist you in your understanding of the things of Almighty God so that you might understand the purpose he has with man and with this earth and man upon it. We thank you for your time.